ready to get started? Yes. Okay. Welcome back to Subject to Cross. I'm Caroline. That's Pete. And this episode is on social media. And its relationship to what we do? Yes. Okay. No, just generally. Let's just talk. No. Oh, just course. social media? No. And relation. Right. it's relation I to I mean, you. after that last thing about my cats, I'm totally, I have no idea what we're doing anymore. <laughs> the whole purpose of a bit is so that people have something to break up the seriousness of the criminal So it's talk. to humanize us? Yes. Okay. We're real people. All right. Well, that's a definition of a bit I can live with. Your other definition, I had no idea what you were talking about. But go ahead. So social media. So social media in the context of a criminal case, the perspective I want to address is oftentimes when somebody is charged with a crime, their charges are published on social media. Hmm. I know that wasn't the perspective you were going to take with this. That's okay. You can take your perspective, but this one seems to really affect the clients I represent. I tend to have a lot of clients between the ages of high school to mid-30s, and the social media aspect really affects them because even if I'm able to work out their case and their case is ultimately withdrawn or dismissed and then I can remove it from the criminal justice system that's called an expungement the initial charges that were put on social media or are in the paper stay there and that is a very tough pill to swallow especially if you're so young and the internet is what it is right and and there's so many sites that are out there now that retain that information that even if we, you know, successfully represent someone and they're acquitted, you know, in other words, found not guilty or the charges are withdrawn, uh, five years later there'll be something on the internet from, you know, who has a criminal record dot com that shows the arrest. So we always caution clients that expungement, which means in the context of a criminal case, destroying government records, doesn't mean that an article in the daily local news or the Philadelphia Inquirer that was a on the internet isn't still out there. Or just those general police blotters that yeah. are posted on the internet. Because if you client, if you client, if you Google the client's name or the client Googles his or her own name, it comes up mm -hmm. and it doesn't go away. Have you ever Googled your own name? Yes. Ew. Well, I had to. I had to yesterday, and actually. Oh, I had to yesterday. Why do you do it like once a week? <laughs> You're so narcissistic. No, here's the context of that tangent, but here's the context of that. And actually, my husband, Ray, caught me um, because I was doing work at his office because I was Googling dumping. yourself. I was on the phone <laughs> with a potential client, and he kept saying, I got this number for you from the internet. And I. It, I didn't recognize the number, and I said, how? And he said, Google. So I Googled my name to look for this number. It was the old Doylestown office number, oh. but I didn't know what it was. And um, Ray walks in. He goes, are you Googling yourself? Yep, sure am. Um, I distracted you. Well, what were we talking about? We were oh. talking about when clients Google themselves. Okay. I actually had a client. Uh, it, it was in the context of a drug allegation and drug case where the transactions were occurring allegedly, in the client's home, the police put the client's name and home and charges, obviously, on the affidavit of probable cause attached to the criminal complaint, and the police blotters put it out on social media, the information about these arrests from the criminal complaint. So in this particular case, not only was my client's name out there, his charges out there, but his home address was out there. And that's a circumstance. Where Did I business think. pick up? No, Peter. I'm sorry. That was a that joke. Was... <laughs> <sighs> business stopped. <laughs> business stopped. Allegedly. Alleged business stopped. Um, but, you know, that's a very unnerving circumstance when not only your name's out there, but your, your home address is out there. And I was making emails to, you know, the various authors of what are you playing with now? Well, this thing's pretty cool. It looks like a little uh, R2-D2, and I'm... I want to know if I'm being recorded. Is this like a video? I don't recording? think it's on. Okay. I really hope not. Cause Look. You... No, that just means it's plugged into the All right. wall. All right. Anyway, that's my angle of social media. How about yours? Well, I, uh, Caroline, was thinking more along the lines of how it can be both harmful to our clients and how we can utilize it to the benefit of our clients. So let's say that you are charged with a crime that involves an allegation of drugs. 
all those pictures you posted on your whether on Instagram or I, I don't know half of them, um, Twitter, Facebook, yeah, all that stuff. You think that they can't find them, and they frequently do find them. I will tell you that Facebook really only cooperates with law enforcement. If you're a defense attorney trying to get information from Facebook, they're going to put you through the ringer. But law enforcement has a way of getting social media information. So those incriminating photos you have, didn't we have a case where, uh, and this was how we used it as a positive, where the kid had a picture of himself in front of all kinds of pot and stuff, right? I love that Oh, stuff. that was uh... – yeah. Well, no, that was the informant. Yeah, right. And the informant, okay, our client was charged with um, possessing with intent to distribute several pounds of a controlled substance. Marijuana. Okay. And uh, Talk like a human. Come on, to the listener. Not controlled substance, it's pot. Of weed. All right. And there was an informant who was test- intending to testify and was cooperating with the police um, and did ultimately testify against the client. But we discovered through various Snapchats that were sent to us in furtherance of our investigation that that informant who said that he was conducting this um, transaction on behalf of our client, who wasn't even there at the time, uh, he was pictured in a different location with that same night with a surrounded by different pounds of weed because they were in different bags and basically gloating in the Snapchat story. So in the hearing on cross-examination, I didn't let him know I had this picture, but I cross-examined him on the fact of what he was wearing that night, and I cross-examined... Look at you. Well, because I wanted to use it at trial. Yeah, Ultimately, yeah, this yeah. case got thrown out before yeah. trial, so that was good. But And I also cross-examined him on um, when he conducted this alleged transaction on behalf of my client, who was not present at the time, uh, if, if it involved a blue bag. Hmm. Because in the picture, there was a blue bag. In the allegations against my client, there was no such thing. And the whole point was to put him on notice without making it abundantly clear to everybody else, I have this picture of you, sir. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ended on that, but the next court hearing, we were able to get the case dismissed. So that's an example of using social media as a, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sword, whatever. And the, the point, I don't want to be too dramatic. The, the, there. In an advantageous s- way. Right. Okay. So I'm getting a little rammy. We've been in here too long I, and I'm not drinking Pedialyte. I'm almost done. Um, so. Social media, how do we use it? Well, we use it in terms of if there is a complainant, if there is a, uh, an alleged victim who is, is uh, you know, claiming that our client did something wrong, we can do social media uh, background checks through our investigator normally, and we accumulate that evidence, and it can potentially be helpful if it can put the victim in a place uh, different or in a mindset different than what the, at the time that they claim a crime was being committed – um, if there's incriminating information on there in terms of their own drug use, for instance, or things that would uh, adversely affect their credibility. So we can use social media in certain circumstances. I mean, there are, there are cases primarily, I, I can't think of any in, locally, the cases where police officer social media has been um, utilized to the benefit of a defendant. Um, and then there are also the concerns, and that's you know another area that I just wanted to briefly touch upon, uh, about clients. The stuff that's on your phone. <laughs> I've had many a case where the police uh, sees someone's cell phone, um, whether the client turns it over voluntarily thinking that things aren't going to be there, or whether the police somehow have a warrant for the phone, and they get into the phone and all of those pictures that you took, all those site I mean, we get these cell phone extraction reports and all your searches, things that you think, you know, you know, for instance, you know, that, that somebody's accused of of uh, plotting to kill their wife and they looked on a on a browser on their phone how to for kill your wife. how to kill your wife. Um, they're all there. Uh, you, you think that they're gone, but they're there. Um, also, and, so, social media in the context of you post things and you're ultimately being investigated for a crime and they use what you post on your social yeah, media you as circumstantial. I do have that now. Yeah. Circumstantial evidence in support of that crime. Although the one I have now is taken totally out of context. So be mindful of uh, of your social media use. 
um, because it can be used against you in in a criminal prosecution. So I, I, my my caution, like I tell my kids, you better be discreet on social media. Um, and you know that's a whole other topic. I mean, I grew up in the social media age when everything was new. I was in high school when I first got Facebook, and it was first a thing for me. But we didn't know what we were getting into. The mm-hmm. social media age, I mean, I think about back in high school, did not know what we were getting into. And now it's just overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And it's here to stay, and nothing can be deleted. Mm-hmm. All right. You may think you can, but you can't. Speaking of deleted. You may think you can. Delete what? your social media. Delete your social media, but you can't. And <laughs> if you're looking at stuff that you shouldn't be able to, that you shouldn't be looking at on the com- on the computer, they're going to find it. It's not going to be deleted. It's going to be in a shelf file or whatever else they they call it. But they have trained uh, police, uh, forensic, uh, IT uh, investigators. They're going to find what's on your phone, man. All right, what's the second bit? Because this is the one I want to do. Okay, you may not know this, but. Caroline has a social media account for her dog. I sure do. And here's the plug. He's at the real Monsieur Wilbur on Instagram. Like Monsieur? Yep. All right. The way you pronounce that was almost like Monsieur. Monsieur. I took French, you know. I did too. Yeah, that's a second. Oh, you took French? I took it for 12 years. Oh. All right. But I can I you speak French? I used to. Parlez-vous be able to... français? Un peu. Uh, right. That means uh, a little. Yep. Yeah. See. Mm-hmm. Good job. All right. Is that it? Is that was that? That was kind the of thing uh, that, that was a double you? bit. Well, I was yeah, I was like happy that I was going to say that you have your dog has a social media. I, think I mean, that's he's weird. not. Well, you know what? Better that he is a social media than I post about him all over mine, which I do post about him quite a bit mm-hmm. on mine. But it's more contained if he has his own account. So you hide behind the dog. Uh, well, no, Wilbur's posting himself. Oh, is he? No, not really. But I actually haven't been very active on his social media because I've been busy, which is why I'm drinking Pedialyte. Do you know that on my phone, probably one out of every three pictures is of A my cat? cats? Yeah. Your that screen... I send to the rest of my family? Yeah. Look. I mean, it doesn't excite me to see pictures of your cats. <laughs> no, that's my son taking a picture of uh, food that he didn't like. Look at that. Yeah, well, they the listeners can't see that. Oh, yeah, but a, I'm showing you. It's a picture of a cat. <laughs> it's a funny picture of a cat. Pete gets excited. There's only one cat that I like, and it's my friend in Boulder's cat. His name is Snickle Fritz. He's a Persian cat. Did you grow up with cats? No. Your parents didn't have any... We don't. We're not a cat family. Do you have dogs? Not until my brother asked for one, but that's a topic for another day. Oh, wow. Well, I think I struck a nerve. <laughs> All right, that's it for this episode. Anything else, Pete? Uh, No. All right, see you next time.